Welcome everybody. It's so nice to see everybody here tonight for Call Him Jack, the story of Jackie Robinson, Black Freedom Fighter. And I'm Laura Wakefield with the National Council for History Education. And I just wanted to make everyone aware at the beginning, just so you know, we um, have a number of webinars throughout the year that are like this. They're so interesting and bring scholars to you and share some ideas for how you can teach these topics. Next week on um, uh, the 16th, Wednesday night, we will also be having a webinar that is similar in the topic. It's exploring the journeys of African-American innovators. And that will be hosted and led by the Henry Ford Museum. So mm -hmm. I hope you'll look on our website, nchteach.org slash webinars, and you can register for that one as well. Without further ado, I want to turn our time over to these amazing scholars. I was thrilled to get this book by uh, Yuthuru Williams and Michael Long and thought that uh, it was something that teachers really needed to have in their hands. So I hope that um, you all will be as excited as I am about welcoming our two scholars here tonight. And I'm going to turn the time over to you two. Thank you, Laura. It's great to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm with Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams is the director of the Racial Justice in Initiative at St. Thomas University. Uh, he's an expert in civil rights. He's written on black politics, among many other issues. Uh, he's got over a million hits, I know, on YouTube for his various uh, episodes on history. So do check him out. Uh, Dr. Williams, welcome. Thank you, Michael. And um, Michael Long is a prolific author. Um, you know, I like to call him a historian, uh, but he uh, has written extensively on Martin Luther King, Jackie Robinson, Bayard Rustin, um, topics in really that focus on the nexus between history and social justice. And so it's a pleasure for us to be able to work together on this book. Um, Michael, welcome. Thanks. Great to be here. So we don't have a lot of time with you. So what we want to do today is talk to you about this book, talk to you about why we wrote this book, give you some interesting stories about Jack, and then take some questions from you. And we want to begin um, where I always like to begin in, in kind of talking about uh, topics like this with some words or conventional wisdom from James Baldwin, who said, the world changes according to the way people see it. And if you can alter even by a millimeter the way that people look at reality, then you can change it. For Michael and myself, what we had to overcome was this sense that everybody knew everything there was to know about the life of Jackie Robinson. In fact, I remember when we were first talking about working on this project together, uh, people saying, you know, there's so many books on Jackie Robinson. And yet at the same time, Michael and I agreed that we didn't want to write a book about Jackie Robinson and the mythology of Jackie Robinson. We wanted to write a book about the man, Jack Roosevelt Robinson, to decouple the myth of Jackie Robinson um, in that moment, that 1947 moment where he and Branch Rickey um, embark on this noble experiment to desegregate baseball. And he becomes the first black player in the 20th century in his nine year career with the Brooklyn Dodgers and all the accolades to decouple that from the life of Jack Roosevelt Robinson in which if we chart him from his earliest years up until um, his death, he was focused on racial justice interested in promoting opportunity and equality for African-Americans, for people of color large writ, but African-Americans in particular. And that's the story we aim to tell and call him Jack. Now, to give you a, a, some sense about why this is important, in fact, Michael and I uh, talk to young people all the time. And one of the things that we like to tell young people um, in particular is that when people say, when your teachers give you that assignment to write that report on George Washington or or Rosa Parks or some person, and you go, what more is there to say? There's always something more to say, and it's all a question of perspective. It goes back to what Baldwin suggested. And in our case, we got affirmation about why this book was necessary and so important. Just last April, when a controversy took place involving um, this player, uh, Tim Donaldson from the Chicago White Sox and a player from the New, from the New York Yankees, and in this altercation that these two players had, um, it ended up uh, making national news and people asked Donaldson, uh, uh, Anderson, excuse me, what did this player say to you that made you so upset? And he responded, he called me Jackie. Well, when Michael and I heard that, we said, something wrong here. 
Because even though we know that Tim Anderson loves Jackie Robinson, the question for us is, why would anyone ever assume that Jackie was a slur? And the reason that Anderson um, later kind of clarified, as he said, you know, like, I respect Jackie as a player and so on and so forth. But when people think about Jackie Robinson, they think about this passive, um, non-aggressive uh, you know, image of this ball player who's come to symbolize, in some sense, um, the impotence of the civil rights movement rather than the kind of more aggressive uh, way that we think about. And when I say aggressive, I don't mean aggressive in terms of fighting back, but I mean aggressive in terms of in your face demands for justice and equality. But the reality is Jackie was both. And so we thought this was kind of an interesting moment for us to say, this is why we need to decouple Jackie from Jack and tell that story differently. I'll give you an ex example of what I mean here. When Jack is inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1963, one of the people who speaks on his behalf that evening is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And it's interesting in that moment how Dr. King chooses to encapsulate Jackie's life. He doesn't talk about Jack being the rookie of the year. He doesn't talk about Jack helping the Dodgers win the World Series. He doesn't talk about Jack's um, RBIs and incredible baseball career and his speed. Or, no, Martin Luther King describes Jack in this way. He he argues, was a sit-inner before the sit-ins and a freedom rider before the freedom rides. Now, one might be tempted to assume that Martin Luther King is doing that in 1963 on the eve of the Birmingham campaign to try to link Jack's legacy with the larger civil rights movement. But the reality is, when you drill down into Jack's life, actually, these things are true. Um, we'll talk about with you briefly Jack's first sit-in, which he takes part in when he's a high schooler in Pasadena, California. He and his friend Ray Bartlett um, refuse to um, leave a segregated lunch counter after they're denied service. He's a teenager in Pasadena, California in the 1930s. We could talk about Jack refusing to give up his seat on a Texas bus in 1944, for which he's nearly court-martialed. In fact, we like to tell people if that case doesn't go Lieutenant Robinson's way, Branch Rickey and Jack Robinson aren't integrating baseball in 1947. That would have been the kiss of death for Jack to have had a criminal record, particularly a criminal record for bucking segregation. And so the subtitle of the book is very important. Jack Robinson, or call him Jack, the story of Jackie Robinson, a black freedom fighter. And that's what Martin Luther King is getting at here in describing Jackie in that way. Um, I want to turn it over to Michael to talk a little bit about Jack's um, uh, childhood and upbringing. But before I do that, um, what I do want to do is give you some sense of why these two chapters that I um, highlighted for you are so important. And I want to talk about that sit-in first. Typically, when we talk about the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s, we frame it in terms of two watershed moments in the 1950s the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education and the Montgomery bus boycott. Occasionally, you'll also hear people refer to the murder of Emmett Till. And it's kind of that trifecta of events that most people associate with the advent of the modern civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. Well, if you look at the issues that kind of percolate around those three events, access to places of public accommodation and access to um, transportation in the case of uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, education in the case of Brown versus Board of Education. And interestingly, with regard to Emmett Till, violence against black and brown people, Jack's life encapsulates episodes which illustrate the ways in which from his birth in 1919 till his death in 1972, he's navigating those so, same issues, but he's doing so in a way where he's always looking for opportunities to push back against the boundaries of segregation. In fact, um, most of you who know me or have seen me present before, you know I, I like to talk about the six degrees of segregation. You'll see those six degrees in Jack's life and you'll see Jack pushing back at various points in his life against this long before he joins the Dodgers and long after. In fact, part of the problem for us as educators, and you know this intimately because we're talking to his, history teachers tonight, social studies teachers, is that our students live in a world and are hopelessly locked in this moment, that the moment that someone's life becomes relevant is the moment in which they achieve fame. Today, more than any moment in our history, their social media culture, it's like, 
when the world discovers you on TikTok, that's the moment that you begin to exist. But Jack's story is about those silent, um, not public acts of resistance, which help to define him as a person and which make him uh, so important and so significant, particularly in a moment where we're celebrating and you, you see people talking about African-American athletes in every sport, uh, pushing back from Maya Moore in basketball to Colin Kaepernick, so on and so forth, whoever it may be. Long before that, Jack was engaged in um, similar activity. And yet at the same time, he didn't always fight back in the way that people um, think about fighting back. He offers a way to think about resistance differently that doesn't always involve being at the front of a protest line, but involves everyday acts of democracy, everyday acts of, of resistance. So let me give you two quick, quick examples of that before I turn it over to Michael. The first story I want to tell you is about Jack in Pasadena in the 1930s. He and his friend Ray Bartlett decide to go down to the local drugstore. And we love to tell this story to young people. We tell it in this way, and I'll share it with you because I know we're all storytellers at heart, and we like to tell a good story to get our students interested. Jack and Ray enter the lunch counter. And at that time, as all of you all know, the lunch counter is this great space. and They want to eat there. Like This is so great. They want to have a hamburger and a malted at the lunch counter. But African-Americans in Pasadena, even though it's California, even though it's West, by virtue of de facto segregation, can't eat at that lunch counter. Jack and Ray have spent money in the store and Jack decides on that afternoon that he and Ray are gonna eat there. And so they sit down at the lunch counter and they wait to be served. The waitress comes up and she looks at him, she goes, you boys know that you can't be here, please leave. Jack and Ray stand firm. She comes back a few minutes later, she's a little annoyed. I thought I told you to leave. Jack and Ray stand firm. At this point, Ray's starting to get a little nervous, but Jack says to him, we're staying here. We spent money here. We have a right to be served here. The waitress comes back a third time, and now she's irate. If you don't leave, I'm going to get the manager. I'm going to call the police. You know you're not supposed to be here. Stop call it causing trouble. Just go. Jack and Ray remain. Several waves of customers come and go, gets a little bit later in the afternoon, Jack and Ray will not relinquish their seats. And finally the waitress comes back after some time and she goes, okay, what do you want? And on that afternoon, Jack and Ray Bartlett eat and that, at that lunch counter in Pasadena. Now let's be clear. Does that result in the desegregation of lunch counters across California? Absolutely not. Um, is that something that we point to as a precursor to the civil rights movement? Not at all, but it demonstrates the everyday acts of resistance that we can chart in African-American history through a biography of a, a notable, significant African-American icon like Jack Robinson. And it also foreshadows the activism that we'll see Jack involved in much later on, which Michael will establish with you when he talks to you a little bit more about Jack's background. The other example I wanna give to you involves not the court-martial of Jackie Robinson, but what happens when Jack first joins um, the Negro Leagues? And as he's a you know, member of um, the team, they are going across country and it was arduous. And, and I don't use that uh, word lightly for African-Americans to travel in Jim Crow America. You could never count on the consistency of treatment. You had to stay in, um, hotels and boarding houses, often which were substandard because those were the only places that were available to African-Americans and because uh, proprietors knew that they didn't have to maintain any standards because this is the only place that Black people could stay. Often they were staying in substandard hotels and being treated as second-class citizens. Well, one day they pull in to get gas at a service station and Jack needs to use the restroom. And his teammates have been here many, many times on the Monarchs and they know the routine, and as they get off the bus, they start heading for the bushes. But Jack walks up to the gas station attendant who is beginning to fill up their massive bus, and he goes, I need to use the restroom, may I have the keys? The attendant chuckles. He goes, the keys? Did you see what your teammates are doing? They're heading to the bushes. We don't have facilities for the color. And Jack takes a step back, thinks for a second, and he says, I don't think he understood me. I need the keys to the facilities. And now the attendant laughs. I just explained to you, we don't have facilities for the colored. 
You're going to have to relieve yourself the way that everybody else does out in the bushes. You're not going to use the restroom here. Jack at that point is irate. And so he looks at the attendant. He goes, if we can't use the facilities, please take the hose out of our gas tank. The proprietor is shocked. He can't believe that Jack is doing this. And so are some of Jack's teammates because they've never seen anyone challenge uh, you know, not only the attendant, they're also concerned. They have a game to get to, so they can't afford to engage in this altercation at this point. But Jack is adamant, and he's telling his teammates, I got this. If we can't be served here, take the hose out of the tank. Well, the attendant realizes Jack's serious. And so he's facing the loss of the sale or allowing Jack to use the facilities. And so he takes the key. He hands it over to Jack to use the restroom. Jack uses the restroom. From that point forward, whenever the monarchs came through that community, they were able to use the restroom because of Jack's act of defiance on that afternoon, because Jack was willing to stand up um, for his rights as an American citizen in that way. It's those stories that we wanted to recover about Jack Robinson to help frame him for a new generation so that you know, people like Tim Anderson, again, Tim Anderson loves Jackie Robinson, but we want people to know Jack Roosevelt Robinson. And Jack Roosevelt Robinson, um, there are many chapters in his life that illustrate the ways in which he fought for racial equality and first-class citizenship for African-Americans. I'm going to turn it over to Michael um, to give you some more info on Jack's background, and then we'll take some questions from you, which will be fun. Mike? Yeah, thanks, Uhuru. Uh, do write your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box, whichever we have, or maybe both. Uh, but while Uhuru was talking, I was just thinking about the power of story-based teaching, as opposed to teaching dry facts and even basic prose sometimes. You know, it's one thing for me to read a civil rights book that's full of uh, prose filled with basic facts. But it's another thing for me to read a really compelling story. And Colin Jack is filled with compelling stories. And we've heard Uhuru go through some of them. And I still find myself captivated by the power of a good story. And I need not tell you this uh, since you're all good educators, but let me just reemphasize it, if I may that stories really capture not only the minds, but the hearts of our students. And the other thing that they do is that they instruct and inspire at the same time. And so while Yuhuru is going through these awesome stories, I'm learning about Jackie Robinson, but I'm also inspired by his story. One of the really awesome things I like about the stories in the book and in Jack's life in general, is that there are so many entry points uh, in relationship to current events that we find in Jack's life. And so yesterday, for example, we read about a student at the University of Kentucky who used the N-word uh, against somebody on staff in what appeared to be a dorm. I'm not sure of the exact facts. But if we were to look at that story or if students ask us about it, or if we mentioned it in the classroom, we find an entry point in Jack's life in many different areas. When he was young, a neighbor across the street called him the N-word uh, when he was just eight years old. And he gets into a rock fight, a stone battle with the girl's father uh, over the use of this N-word. Uh, and Jack, sh and it's inspiring because Jack stands up for himself when somebody hurls the N word at him. Uh, you know, it just came across. I study nonviolent protests a lot, and I see them happening every day. And so, if you teach about nonviolent protests, you can find them all through Jack's life. Uh, excuse me. In 1963, he marched with Dr. King, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. He took his two, he took his three kids with him, Jackie Jr. and Rachel and uh, David. 
and Rachel, I'm sorry, and Sharon, the daughter, and Rachel, uh, his wife, also went. And so the entire Robinson family went. And Jack actually spoke at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Not too many people know this. He also commented on the possibility of a Black president. There's another beautiful entry point. We just went through a national election, and Jack was so involved in politics and civil rights after baseball. In 1960, he took a leave from his job at Chock Full of Nuts in New York City. He was the vice president of personnel. He took that job after he left baseball. He took a leave from there, and he campaigned full-time for Richard Nixon. I was thinking about this last night when I saw a Black candidate uh, became a Republican senator. Uh, he won re-election. And I was thinking, wow, I wonder what Robinson would think about that. That's an entry point into Robinson's life. Robinson selected Nixon as his favorite candidate over John F. Kennedy, right? Because he thought that Nixon would advance rights for Black Americans more than Kennedy did. Now, Kennedy was part of the Democrats. He was aligned with Dixiecrats. Uh, he didn't vote first time for the 1957 Civil Rights Act. He voted to send it back to committee. And here's Nixon. Nixon steered passage of the 1957 Civil Rights Act. He had gone to Africa. He had sworn to Robinson that he would be uh, faster on civil rights than his boss. Dwight Eisenhower ever was. And so Robinson backs Nixon. He's a fervent believer in Nixon. Eventually, he sours on him, even during the campaign, when Dr. King is in jail at Reedsville State Prison. Uh, Robinson goes in, they're on a train at the time, and Robinson goes in and speaks with Nixon about calling Coretta Scott King and expressing his concern. And Nixon says, I can't do that. That'd be grandstanding if it got out uh, to the public. That's what he says. And Robinson leaves that meeting with tears in his eyes. And he almost leaves the campaign. But Branch Rickey, the general manager of the Dodgers, talked him into staying. Eventually, he sours on Richard Nixon when Richard Nixon says that civil rights won't be part of the next presidential election. And Robinson turns his attention to Democrats. Robinson's political dream, which is what I would talk about today if I were teaching Robinson in the classroom, was for a two-party system. He thought it was problematic for Black Americans to become part of the back pocket of the Democratic Party. He thought the Democratic Party would take advantage of Black Americans and just take them for granted. What Robinson wanted Black Americans to do was to hold back from both parties, to suspend their votes, and then to vote on whichever candidate and for whichever party would most advance Black interests. Sometimes Robinson believed that was a Republican candidate and the Republican Party. At other times, he thought it was a Democratic candidate and the Democratic Party. So there are lots of lessons. If I were teaching Black Lives Matter in the class, I would talk about the police brutality that Robinson suffered when he was a kid, when he was growing up in Pasadena. Uh, he couldn't attend, he couldn't, I'm sorry, swim at the local pool, the Brookside Plunge, uh, seven days a week. He and other kids of color could only go there one day out of the week. It was called International Day, as if the kids of color were not part of the local social fabric. And then after they swam there, the local authorities drained the pool and scrubbed the walls and refilled the pool with clean water as if to suggest that the kids of color carried infectious diseases. And so Robinson and his friends went to the local reservoir to swim, and it was against the law, and local police officers showed up, some of whom were probably former members of the KKK. The KKK had been active in Pasadena, and they pulled their guns on Robinson. It's not the only time police officers pulled their guns on Robinson. He faced it two more times. One, and in Harlem, this was long after he had become famous for being a star on the baseball diamond. So there's another entry point into Robinson's life. If, so I won't go through all of these, but I will suggest that the beauty of Robinson's story is that there are all these connections to current events and their current and their connections and their entry points 
into these beautiful events and not so beautiful events that are happening today. In fact, I want to turn this back to Dr. Williams to just say a word about teaching by proximity. I think I'm going to get that phrase wrong, but we can use Robinson's life to do this. Yeah, I think it's a great point, Michael, that the idea that what you can do as an educator is um, if you don't want to tackle difficult questions or difficult topics in the classroom, you can teach by proxy and comment by proximity. And Robinson's life is a great example of teaching by proxy and commenting by proximity. When Robinson takes that stand um, against, or better yet, the example that Michael just gave to you, denied access to the pool, Robinson and his friends and and sunny California choose to swim in a reservoir and they're greeted with police who pull guns on them. And they're just a bunch of kids swimming in the, in the reservoir. Uh, that's a good example of being able to comment on um, injustice that people of color experience sometimes in public places and who enforces that. You're not talking about this in terms of the contemporary moment, but you're able to use Robinson to kind of uh, create an opportunity for, for young people to understand that dynamic and historically what the roots of that dynamic are. Another good example of that is what Michael mentioned to you with regard to Jack on elections. Jack was a firm believer in the American uh, Republican form of government. And you see him articulating that consistently throughout his life, that he believes in democracy, he believes in the machinery of government. And he's most disappointed when he sees people working to manipulate that in ways that undermine the very fabric of the democratic process. And we capture some of those um, chapters in the book when we talk about um, him falling out with Nixon and later Nelson Rockefeller. Um, so uh, Barry Goldwater, excuse me, not Nelson Rockefeller. And the reason why he was so enamored of Rockefeller is because he felt that Rockefeller put country first and that he respected the democratic process. So there are ways to kind of engage some of the, the contemporary through um, an examination of Robinson's life. Um, you, you're probably asking yourself at this point, why do we emphasize call him Jack? And um, uh, Michael, do you want to talk about that? Uh, no, but let me just mention a quick uh, entry point into patriotism. Patriotism comes up all the time, several times a year in major issues. And near the end of his life, Robinson said that he could no longer sing or stand for the national anthem. Fascinating. He also said that in 1969, there's a beautiful entry point into teaching about patriotism. Why did Robinson sour on US democracy? And he did, he absolutely did. His lie, his explanation is very brief, very vague. He says, I know I'm a black man in a white world. That says a lot in 1972. He's still sensing the white backlash that's going on there, and he's still fighting against it. Uh, in the last year of he, his life, he decides that he's going to back a construction company that will build uh, new neighborhoods for kids. And this, too, is part of his American dream, to create safe and, what he says, clean neighborhoods for kids so they don't have to grow up in impoverished environments. Wow, economic justice is another entry point. You Hoover, go ahead and jump in there about call him Jack. Well, no, I'm gonna extend your um, dialogue here for just a second too to say, and this is why ending the Jackie Robinson story or beginning the Jackie Robinson story with 1947 and ending in 55 is problematic because you're missing the essence of the story of not just Jack Roosevelt Robinson, but a black family. What you capture with the Robinsons, if you go, we'll just go back a couple of slides. This is the story of the great migration. Robinson is born in Cairo, Georgia. His mother, um, Miley, flees Georgia after the, his father abandons the family and she's left to fend for herself with a plantation owner who is unscrupulous in his, um, basically robbing uh, the family of their ability to make a living. She doesn't want her children to be reared in that, um, the, steeped in that economic inequality and stifled in the way that she had been. And so she boards what she calls the freedom train to California, to the promised land. When they get to California, interestingly, you'll see here, the Robinson family, this is his mother, integrate a neighborhood by purchasing a home, which they call the mansion. Their neighbors are so incensed that the Black family has moved into the home that they stage a protest and they even burn a cross on the Robinson's uh, lawn. The, these are stories. Jack Robinson's story is the story of Black America. 
if you pick this book up, what you'll find in telling the Jack story is that Jack's story mirrors what's happening in the 20th century with regard to um, people of color. We mentioned 1944. Jack is in the military. Um, he, uh, the United States is at war with uh, Nazi Germany. And of course, the Nazis have this uh, propaganda about this, the, the Aryan race and the superiority of the Aryan race. This presents a problem for the United States because when the United States pushes back, the Nazis come with their own propaganda and say, how dare you make reference to us? Look at the treatment of the American quote unquote Negro. So there's no way you can be critical of what we're doing because it's no different. The US Army is put in a difficult position. It has to respond. It needs to bolster the morale of African-American troops who they need desperately. And it also has to answer this question internationally. They've got to control what they control, what they can control. They can't control what's happening in um, the hamlets and villages and towns in the deep south or in Pasadena in terms of de facto segregation. They can't issue a ruling that says there's to be no, or order, excuse me, that there's to be no segregation on US Army posts. Lieutenant Robinson reads about this. And in 1944, he's on this uh, bus in Texas. He's speaking to a light-complected woman whom the driver assumes is a white woman because of her complexion. The driver stops the bus and immediately demands that Lieutenant Robinson remove himself from the white section of the bus to the colored section of the bus. Lieutenant Robinson refuses. Later on, when he's asked why he refused, he said, I remember reading those army orders and I knew that there was to be no segregation on army bases. And we were on an army base when that unreasonable request was made of me. Well, people get irate. One of the women on the bus, this white woman, demands that the police be called in order to deal with Robinson. The police are called. And at that point, Robinson, um, the police officers ask Robinson why he hasn't yielded the bus or why he hasn't yielded a seat. And Lieutenant Robinson responds, um, he had been called out of his name, called the N-word, um, and he knew what his rights were. So he's arrested. And I said this to you earlier, this doesn't go Jack's way. He can't be because of that moment, the person that Branch Rickey will bring into the Dodgers, because immediately the, the cries will be, he's a criminal, right? He's a subversive. What ends up happening is Jack goes before a military tribunal and they ask Lieutenant Robinson, why did you refuse to give up your seat? He mentions the army um, orders, but they go one step further. They say, why did you push back against being called the N word? And Jack says, because my mother taught me that that refers to a low and uncouth person. I don't consider myself low. I don't consider myself uncouth. I don't consider myself an N-word. When you capture that with Jack Roosevelt Robinson, pre-baseball, along with the story that I told you about the monarchs, then you chart him through baseball, and then you pick him up after baseball, as Michael mentioned, taking a job with Chock Full of Nuts, a popular restaurant chain in New York City, where he'll use his uh, platform as vice president for human resources to advocate for and create more opportunity for jobs for people of color, African-Americans and Latinos in particular. You'll see him establishing with his colleagues Freedom National Bank in Harlem to provide low interest loans for African-Americans to buy homes and for black entrepreneurs to be able to start businesses. Why did Jack feel so strongly about this? Because Jack Roosevelt Robinson was able to buy a home in Stanford, Connecticut, only with the assistance of a powerful friend in publishing. And then when he got to Stanford, wasn't allowed to use a local golf course because he was black. The Robinsons knew intimately the sting of racial inequality in America. It is the story, not just of Jack, but of Rachel, but not just of Jack and Rachel, of an African-American family. And in the ways that Michael just shared with you, Jack becomes a conduit to say, this is what the great migration looked like. This, these are the push-pull factors. You see them in Robinson's life in terms of the civil rights movement. These are the disagreements and what people are grappling with. Freedom now, um, as the more militant civil rights people talked about, or we, you know, we shall overcome. And then later, Black power. So you get all of these in the life of this incredibly complex and interesting individual, but only if you call him Jack, only if you teach Jack. Jackie will only give you those years with the Dodgers and that kind of stage story about Robinson, which is problematic in so many ways because Jackie, in a lot of ways, is an invention. To that point, we wanna just emphasize a couple of newspaper articles you can see here where Jack is identified as Jack. Jack used um, 
uh, sign uh, his baseballs as Jack. He signs letters as Jack. So we, one of the points that we make in the book is that when you see Robinson, you know, Jackie's a nickname and we've had people say that as well, you know, they did that in baseball. It's like Pee Wee and so on and so forth. But understand, and Jack did, that when people said Jackie, there was a little sugar on it. It was like calling him boy. It was like denigrating him, right? And it was this persona, this character that he was expected to take on. And what you see before baseball is that Jack Roosevelt Robinson, the essence of who Jack Roosevelt Robinson, the fighter, the thinker, right, remains. And you'll see him after baseball referring to himself as Jack. Um, I had the good fortune of working at the Jackie Robinson Foundation. Michael and I actually met working on Kim Burns' documentary on Jackie Robinson. And Michael likes to tell people that the reason he reached out to me, the reason I loved him is that at the foundation, we always assigned our scholars one of Michael's books, First Class Citizenship, the letters um, that Jack wrote to political leaders later in his life, Rockefeller and Martin Luther King and, and, and Malcolm X and his newspaper columns. And what struck me about that is it was important for us to be able to share with those young scholars who were part of the Jackie Robinson Foundation, a different portrait of Jack that was decoupled from baseball. Like this is a person who dedicated his life to, and that's what we were trying to communicate to them about the values of the foundation, so on and so forth. But what Michael said is that, you know, what I was drawn to in the documentary is you kept calling him Jack. I mean, you kept saying that. Well, I worked with Rachel and I was surrounded with the documents at the foundation. And it just seemed natural to refer to him in that way because at the core, he was always Jack. Jackie's a moment. Jack's the life. Michael? Yeah, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box, if you would. We have a question. Uh that I'll get to right now. And that's from Jim Costello or somebody pretending to be Jim Costello. <laughs> anyway, if it is Jim, hey Jim, uh, good question here about Campanella and Don Newcomb. Uh, I don't know, I didn't come across a whole lot of information about Newcomb, but I can tell you that Robinson had a peculiar relationship with Campanella. Uh, they clashed early on in some ways. They had really different personalities. Uh, Robinson was aggressive. Uh, he could be loud. He could be brash. Uh, he could be unlikable because of those things. Some people found him unlikable. It's interesting. In, in his autobiography published in 1972, posthumously, uh, he said that a lot of people liked me when I, how does he put this, when I integrated a lily white sport and kept my bent back, my back bent, but when I straightened my back and started to speak out, then people started to see a different person and they didn't like me as much. And he was right, he was right about that. Uh, he. He wasn't especially popular uh, at certain points in his life because he spoke out so much. And he wrote a column for the New York Post uh, in which he talked about a lot about politics and civil rights. And he got a lot of criticism for that. And basically, a lot of people told him to shut up and dribble, as uh, Laura Ingram told uh, LeBron James famously at one point. And LeBron James' comeback was, I don't know who she is. <laughs> That was quite the diss, but I want to get back to your question. Uh, Don Newcomb uh, was quiet. He was very likable. Uh, he was very popular. He was mild-mannered. In many ways, he was not uh, Jack Robinson. And Robinson was especially hard on fellow Black players who weren't active or outspoken about civil rights. And Campy wasn't. And he was hard on Campy exactly for that reason. He was really hard on Campy. Uh, he rallied around him uh, at the time of the accident. Uh, and Campanella came to write a book uh, that Jack edited. It was about, in part, about Black freedom and Black civil rights. And they grew closer, I think, as uh, they grew older. I wish I had more information for you about Don Newcomb, but I don't. Uh, Yuhuru, do you have anything yeah. to add there? No, just very briefly on the Campanella thing. 
to give you, somebody asked about what is teach by proxy, comment by proxy, somebody, I think it's Joe Rainey. Joe, I'm going to answer that in two ways. I'll answer it by giving a, a contemporary example using the thing that uh, Michael just talked about. Right now in the NBA, there's this controversy involving Brooklyn, Brooklyn Net star Kyrie Irving and um, a tweet that he sent, which is problematic and, and contained a link to an anti-Semitic um, uh, movie with anti-Semitic messages, horrible movie with anti-Semitic messages. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar came out hard against Kyrie Irving in the same way the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has been very consistent in saying that African-American athletes have a duty and responsibility to represent the community. And so that is how Jack is kind of like that elder statesman in a way that Kareem is today. And if you watch Kareem's interview the other night on CNN, where he was talking about the Kyrie Irving situation, that's very much in my ear what I could hear the lecture Jack giving to other ball players in their moment about what it meant to stand up, to be role models, but to recognize the kind of larger implications of activism and their duties and responsibilities that come along with it. So it's a good way. Um, for Joe, give you a very good example of teach by proxy, comment by proximity. In the aftermath of January 6th, a bunch of people wanted to go into the classroom and talk about that. There are places where that's not a wise move, but I never have to go into the classroom and tackle a difficult subject directly, even though I know my students have those questions. I don't have to teach January 6th to raise issues about what happens when people challenge the leg legitimacy of an election or even when mobs threaten the seat of government because they're not having or they feel like their interests haven't been met. My example for that is Little Rock, 1957. It gives you all the pieces to talk about all the dimensions that you saw on January 6th without ever having to talk about January 6th directly. If students organically come to ask questions or see parallels, you're responding to those questions, but you're not putting yourself in a position where you directly have to take on that controversial subject. If you look to Little Rock as an example, Eisenhower's response to Governor Faubus is a uh, masterclass in the fundamentals of American civics and democracy. He says, we fought the Civil War and the South won. This is a question of national unity. Our democracy can't endure having people assume that interposition and nullification issues that went the way of the dinosaur with John C. Calhoun when the South was vanquished exist today. It is my duty to enforce the ruling of the US Supreme Court. And so therefore we can't have this. If we do, it would undermine the very fabric of our democracy. And it puts young people at the center because the person that you can kind of situate there is Melba Patilla Beals, her book, Warriors Don't Cry, where she talks about recording in her diary on uh, January um, 1958. Uh, she says, and I quote her, um, I thought to myself, is it that no one cares or nobody knows what to do? I imagine in a lot of ways, the way that young people see so many things in our contemporary society, just teaching Melba Patilla Beals to kind of illustrate the ways in which at various other points, young people have had the same questions about where the nation is going and using these kind of proxy points to be able to talk about that history in meaningful ways. I would not teach, I did not have to talk about Colin Kaepernick in the classroom. I'll talk about Mexico City in 1968 and the protest of uh, uh, Juan Carlos and Tommy Smith. There's a new book, Victory Stand, that talks about that. Or I'll uh, provide the example that um, Michael just gave of Jackie Robinson in 1969 or Jackie Robinson in 1972, shortly before his death, saying, you know, I will not believe that, um, you know, baseball has achieved all it can achieve until I look down the third base line and see a black coach standing back at me. This is an unfinished revolution at this point. In the recent World Series, we know there was much made of the fact that there were no, for the first time, um, African-American born, foundational black Americans playing in the World Series. It's hard not to see that people say, well, but there, there are international players and there are black players. But the point is that baseball every year celebrates Jackie Robinson Day. And they, what does it say if we haven't maintained that commitment? Because there are other issues that Jack would have recognized immediately that point to the fact that this isn't just about representation on the field of play. This is about access to fields. This is about economics. This is, so there's so much larger than that, but that's what we mean by teach by proxy, comment by proximity is finding parallel think, um, um, historical events that can allow you to shine a light on contemporary moments without putting yourself in jeopardy of being, or being accused of, you know, kind of talking about something that's controversial. There's so many wonderful episodes in history to do that. And again, the life of Jackie Robinson provides a window into so many.
Uh, we have another question here, uh, Michael, let you handle this. Any stories, ideas on how to get students to understand that Jackie had to restrain himself in the majors for the first couple of years before he could fight back and be outspoken and how the media turned on him when that happened? Okay, uh, let me just start with a quick story and then we'll go to that. And I see Mark Olson has a question here. You, you and I might be looking at different areas, but that's okay. So Jack, uh, when he played, when he debuted with Brooklyn Dodgers, lived close to the stadium and uh, in the Brooklyn area. And during the Christmas season, and Jack and Rachel were always sensitive about impoverished people. So during the Christmas season, when they're walking around their neighborhood, they see that, they see all the Christmas lights and they notice this one house that doesn't have Christmas lights. And so Jack and Rachel, I don't know whether it was Christmas Eve or it was close to it. They showed up at the house with a Christmas tree and it was their gift of the family. And the family, husband and wife opened the door. They were shocked to see a Christmas tree. And Jack and Rachel were very joyful presenting the tree. And they said, uh, we're Jewish. <laughs> but the family, it's a great story. It's a great ending. So the family welcomed the Robinsons into their home and they put up the Christmas tree and they decorated it together. I just wanted to tell that story in light of Yuhuru's earlier point about anti-Semitism. There's another story. I don't think we included that in the book either, did we, Yuhuru? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of stories out there. Story. So I see Mark's story. I just forgot. I forgot the question that you asked. So I'm going to turn that one over to you. I'm going, I'm going to Mark's here. Why do you feel these stories and acts of Jack have not made it to the mainstream knowledge and historical story of Jack? I think, uh, Mark, it's because, in part, we like to freeze our heroes at a particular point in history. So we freeze Dr. King, for example, in 1963 at the March on Washington and the, his I Have a Dream speech. And it's a great moment to freeze him, no doubt. But we forget that King was also a democratic socialist, that he was fiercely anti-war, that he was a fierce pacifist. And we lose the fuller dimension. We freeze Rosa Parks on December 5th, 1955, when she refuses to surrender her seat to a white man on a bus in Montgomery. And we forget when we freeze her that she was active in the NAACP leading up to that. We forget that she was active in the campaign to free the Scottsboro Boys. Uh, we forget her civil rights activity before that. And so we lose, we lose the multidimensionality of these figures, right? We did the same thing with Jack. We freeze him in April 15th, 1947, when he debuts with the Dodgers. Why do we freeze him there? If you ask me, it's partly because he's so safe, so non-threatening in some ways so passive. Uh, he's not threatening to white Americans. So I think we've latched onto him in April 15th, 1947 for that reason. It's also a big reason, you know, he integrates uh, the United, he integrates America's game. He makes us feel good about ourselves. Look at us, we've embraced Jack Robinson. I don't want to be too cynical here, but I think that's part of this story. Uh, Yuhuru, do you want to go to the question that you had posed? Yeah, and I think it's tied to the one that you just answered. So any stories on how to get students to understand that Jackie had to restrain himself? Um, you know, I think Michael tells a great one, or and this is in the book, but I love the way that Michael tells it. So I will start it. I'll let him finish it. But I will frame it first by saying that that meeting between Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson, which we, we've all seen kind of reenacted in the early Jackie Robinson movie, The Jackie Robinson Story. And, you know, um, we saw in the biopic 42 is tense because Jack is a fighter. So it's not that Jack is kind of passively going into this agreement with Branch Rickey. He recognizes what's on the line and he endures these racial slurs. But uh, Michael likes to tell this story. Um, and it, it's relating to what we talk about early in Jack's academic, uh, uh, early in Jack's uh, high school career, athletic career, not academic career, but athletic career, um, even in, in, in middle school. When Jack is being assailed by crowds, when he's playing for Montreal, or when he ultimately or eventually gets to the Dodgers, he's not hearing language that he hasn't heard before. So this idea that, you know, the first time that Jackie had been met by a chorus of boos in the N-word from the crowd, it's just not factual. Jack had faced that many times. Michael loves to tell a story about Philadelphia, and he relates that to 
what happens with that young girl when he's just eight years old and he's sweeping up in front of his home and trying to keep the exterior of the home tidy. And the little girl comes out and um, verbally assaults him and, and Jack says something back to her. And then the father comes out and engages in this rock battle with him. But when uh, Ben Chapman, the coach of the Phillies is um, just giving Jack the business along with his, uh, his team, using all kinds of uh, vile language to describe him. Um, we have in the book, Jack's recollections in that moment that he said, I felt like taking my defiled black fist and going over and knocking those guys out. And I like that because it captures the humanity of Jack Robinson in that moment, struggling with what it means to honor his commitment, um, the commitment that he made to Branch Rickey, but also struggling with his own sense that, you know, this hurts because this is happening in a way that is, is um, denying me my humanity, my, the very essence of my humanity. When you see Jack speaking out later on and all that fire comes out, um, and, and Michael talked about this just a few minutes ago, and he starts to get some of the uh, pushback from the media. They don't like that. They like the safe Jackie. In the same way that it relates to another story we tell in the book, and that's the story of his testimony before HUAC, House on American Activities Committee, um, and Paul Robeson. It is true that Jack describes Robinson in an unfavorable way when he talks about a swan song and bass. But if you read Jack's testimony, what the press reports that Jack said and what Jack said are very different. Jack's statement is a very militant statement in favor of the um, dignity of Black people. He says, I can't speak for all Black people, but I know that I've got too much invested in this country, and they do, to throw it all away based on the comments of one person. But he doesn't repudiate Robeson in the way that the media um, tries to frame him as this champion who came in and these two Black men are at odds. He basically says, we have the right to all the things that Robeson has talked about, but you know, I, I, I'm not going to embrace the Soviet Union to do that. I don't need to do that. That's my birthright as an American citizen. So those are just a couple of examples of things that you could use to show that tension um, that Jack is dealing with as he's navigating, you know, um, these spaces and the real, you know, turmoil and trauma that causes. I know we're, we only have a few minutes left, but I think it leads me to a way to talk about Jack's death and how um, we like to make the case that racism in some sense contributed to that. So Michael, if you don't mind telling that, that final story about Jack's final day on the planet. Uh, sure. On October 24th, 1972, uh, Jack is in the shower and Rachel is in the kitchen making breakfast, uh, typical standard fare, standard day, and she hears a commotion and she hears Jack call her name. And so she, she also hears Jack running down the corridor, down the hallway. She runs out to meet him because she knows something's wrong. And he grabs a hold of her and holds her tight and he says, I love you. And then he collapses to the ground and he dies of a heart attack I, around 7.10 in the morning. Uh, he dies of a heart attack, complications from diabetes. Up to this point, there had been talk about possible amputation of a leg. He was virtually blind and he was blind in one eye and, and going blind in the other. So he'd been suffering for quite some time. And there was a recent article, it came out last year, Hubert just mentioned it. And there were some medical doctors who were making the case that racism really contributed to Robinson's early death. And it makes a world of sense to me. I mean, this guy faced death threats when he, when he went on to the baseball diamond. I mean, you know, it's one thing to compile Hall of Fame statistics as he did. Rookie of the Year, 1947. Most valuable player, 1948. Helped the Dodgers win the World Series. Batted 311. Awesome player. But he did all that under intense pressure, thinking that people were going to kill him, they might kill his family. That's incredible. I can see how that would contribute to his early death. Yuhuru? I think that um, nothing to, to add. Just I love when you, you tell that story, and I think it's important for young people to understand that. The notion of epigenetics we talk about now, but again, as Michael emphasized earlier, if you can just tell that story in a way that's compelling to young people, um, Jack had dealt with all those traumas. He was very young when he passed, but you know that frustration and the and the the scars that that left that were invisible. 
um, were also really important in kind of, uh, of telling his story. And then just to tie this into Mike's point or, or Mike's question, yeah, Mike, he swallowed so much in that first year. My favorite scene in 42 is when he goes into the dugout and he smashes his bat. And I think that's right after Ben Chapman of the Philadelphia Phillies has been hurling every nasty word at him. And he just stands there and takes it. Jonathan Eig, a sports writer and, and a, just an awesome writer, makes the case that Robinson swallowed all that and turned it into muscle. I think that's true. I think he also swallowed it and it just ate him up as well early on. One of my favorite parts of the book is uh, when he sort of explodes in 1949, I believe the picture comes from, there's this great picture of Jack punting his mitt and you can see it high in the air. <laughs> and he's really angry at a, at a call that had just been made, but it, he comes to explode in many ways. And I think that fury uh, was erupting in him early on. Hey, thank you all so much. It's been great chatting with you. And and thanks to Laura as well for the invitation. This was terrific. And I, I just really encourage you all to, to check out this book because it has so many uh, images and so many uh, primary source documents and things like that. And I I, I think we probably could sit here all night and ask questions and, and learn more about Jack, but he's such a great representation of a complex that, that often the people that we he make heroes out of, we, we as you said, freeze them in time and, and they're, they're one dimensional and, and he's such a complex person. And it's so wonderful to have an opportunity to use him to teach history. So I, I thank you both for your time and for this terrific book and, and encourage everybody you will get a teacher's guide or you should may have already gotten it when you registered um, to, to help you with teaching the book, but it, it's a really great read and I think kids would really enjoy it as well. So thank you all so much.